entre les spectateurs. Donc, euh, on se, maintenant, on se tient, on ne fait plus de commentaires. Okay. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à tous. On, on fait rentrer progressivement. Hello, everyone. We're letting people in, little by little. Welcome all to this African Climate Change Summit 2021 organized by Climate Change, CETUD, and CODATU. There is English-French live translation. You can click on the globe at the bottom of your screen to choose your channel. French and English is the presenter. You can click on the globe at the right side of your screen to choose your channel. And je crois que Tout le monde est plus ou moins en place. I think everyone's in place. I will now give the floor to Christian. Bonjour. For the introduction. Hello, everyone. Christian Philippe. Today, September 16th, we should be in Dakar for an official meeting with the President of the Republic of Senegal this week for climate and sustainable urban mobility organized by CETUD, Climate Change and CODATU. CODATU. However, the health sanitary crisis has decided otherwise and we will have to wait till next year to meet in presence, as we say now, the three organizers However, wanted to still have this webinar to show that this does not mean that we are stopping our activities, but that rather we are celebrating together a year of work to offer an event next year, which we hope will be even more attractive. Just before COP26, before COP27, which should take place in Africa next year, we want to identify even more so our priorities, to list our best practices, to also look at our recommendations and projects, which we will present next year in Dakar. Three roundtables will enable, enable us to do it at the initiatives of the CETUD. Also, there will be a prize award for contributions in this introduction, I will first give the floor to our three organizers of this summit of this week. And this morning, we will start with the president of the CODATU, Mr. François Durovray, Durovray, who has been the president of CODATU since last July. He's also the president of the regional council of the Essonne region. This is, you have the floor. François, hello everyone, very glad to be here with you. Of course, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here with us and joining this webinar. I want to greet those who have organized this meeting with us. I'm thinking about the CETU, the Executive Council for uh, Urban Transport in Dakar, and of course, Climate Chance with Renaud Dantec, its president, who will take the floor just after me. Christian Philippe has explained to us that despite the health crisis, still we've been able to organize this time this morning. Of course, we want to address the issue of mobility, which seems to be at the heart of climate change. And we want to say that we are mobilized for a possible meeting in Dakar next year possibly the second half of September of next year. And in our last discussions with President Dantec, uh, gives us hope to have a meeting between September 19 to 24th of next year. It's important to meet in Dakar. This is where the dynamics had started in 1980. After almost 40 years of actions, there is a great need for sharing between cities from the north from the south, from technician, between technicians, decision makers, technicians, etc. I will maybe slow down a little bit for our translators. I'm 
sure that everyone is aware of the fact that mobility is at the heart of current changes due to uh, climate change, of course, to transitions, energy transitions, and mobility weighs heavily in the carbon prints in all of our territories. And we are aware that all of our local governments, our local leaders play a crucial role to enable this, this transition and make it available to all and accessible to all. Of course, there is a great challenge facing us in the coming years. As we know that cities, especially cities from the South will host 2 point, an additional 2.5 billion people in the years to come someone has the mic on anyway this is a huge challenge for due to this tremendous demographic growth in the cities in the south we know very well that when we talk about networks of all kinds this is a priority for all these cities we're talking about water network grids uh, power grids energy grids etc talking also about transportation, there is absolute emergency to dialogue, to reinforce this cooperation, this dialogue between the North and the South, not in a one-way system, but in a sharing way, because I believe that together we can learn from each other's mistakes, mistakes from the North, during the last decades, and I believe that the cities from the South will have to learn uh, from new systems that are emerging. I'm hoping that our discussions today will help us to come up with some practical proposals, concrete proposals in terms of financing, in terms of governance. And we do have in France now for some weeks we have new tools, which I hope will help us to go further in terms of planning or integration and integrating a new modes for multimodality. We will also need to monitor these measures in an efficient way. I think this is a decisive moment for us today. And I hope that this plenary session will help us to move on and to imagine new solutions, common solutions in order to speed up the energy transition, to facilitate mobility and to improve governance. For each and every one of us, I would like to wish you a happy morning of discussions and work. Thank you very much. Climate Chance wanted to join such a project initiated by the Codatu Institute, and that's been of a great help to us regarding what Climate Chance is representing for us. Therefore, I'm very happy to give the floor to Renan Dantec. Thank you, Christian. Indeed, this is a great joy to work with you, to work with the CODATU and CITUD for a long period of time. Now we've been working together for almost a year and we will continue to do so until next year. Uh, you can already note the date of 1924th of September of next year in Dakar for a physical summit, even though I can say we have learned much from our technical and uh, IT tools this common session this morning, just to give you a direction and insist on the outcomes for the African continent, the opening of the third African summit here at Climate Chance, which will last for the next for two days, another two days, with many sessions until Friday. It's already a success. For most of our sessions, we already have over 5,000 people who have registered 
which is more than the main summit we had in Africa in 2017. Just a few words to say that Climate Chance is an international network. It is not a French organization. It's an international network with active members. And I'm greeting those who will be with us this morning. There are several of them. Our purpose is to put together uh, in a network the non-state actors. Of course, governments do have agreements like the Paris Agreement, but there are also ongoing work to reduce gas emissions, to adapt territories. And these actions are carried out by local governments, territorial governments. And we will be greeting the mayor of Ouagadougou. And also we have many companies who are partners of climate chance. And we are supported by many other NGOs and associations this network, mainly on the, front, on the African continent, is yet not sufficient. Of course, there are still many good things that are being done, which we don't know about, but this network is not sufficient in order to communicate to the uh, financial backers, to the institutions, governments, etc. Et that's the whole purpose of the work that Climate Chance is doing, is to put all these people in touch with one another. Thank you for all those who have mobilized for this summit to reinforce our connections, to try to come out of our silos, to not just work with companies, but to work all together. This virtual summit, as we've done for all of our summits, is also a call for contributions to look at success stories. We've had over 100 responses, which you can find on our website. You will find about 50 videos, short videos, pitches, which will uh, present these contributions, which is really what is at the heart of our action. We will try to keep on time, to not go, go over time. We will also have another message of introduction. This is a virtual summit because of the health crisis, of course, which even last year, uh, last year we had to cancel our summit, by the way. This crisis, of course, is changing the way we are doing things. And we cannot but analyze the consequences of this crisis, especially coming to the climate issues I just want to say a few things this morning in my introduction. First of all, we have to be helping one another. There is a need for solidarity. Climate action has to be based on solidarity. Each has to take their responsibility to reduce gas emissions and to take part in the adaptation process. We cannot act, ask African actors to take part in this common effort. And of course, Africa has a role to play in reducing gas emissions through their forests. Africa also has to play a role in terms of urban development to make sure it will be respectful to reduce gas emissions, etc. We cannot ask Africa for this effort if the rich country, countries are not helping part of this action has to be focused on access to vaccine and fighting against COVID-19. This is a key message. Secondly, and we see this in Europe through the new European New Green Deal, this economic recovery after this crisis has to include climate issues, transition issues, energy transition, etc. It should be the same on the African continent. We will need recovery plans. Africa has been highly hit in terms of economy because of the crisis. We need to have recovery plans with international financial backers. There will be a session on access to financing this morning. So we need to include this aspect for this recovery. We need to work around these issues, continue to group all of our stakeholders, non-state stakeholders and actors together with the state governments. 
this is what I wanted to say this morning. And we want to thank those that are here, the speakers, our attendants, and thank all of our partners. Without our partners, without this mobilization, we would not be able to do this summit, to organize this summit. This is what I wanted to say. Christian, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to Tierno, who is the general director or secretary for the CETUD. Without them, we would not have been able to organize this. And we are so sorry that we cannot be together with him in Dakar this week. And this will be hopefully the case next year. The CETUD is an authority. It's one of the organizers. Uh, they are a reference to us and a reference in Africa. We are very glad to be able to co-organize together with CETU this common work. Tierno, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian. I would like to start by greeting our participants. Of course, I want to thank also CODATU and Climate Chance for their great efficiency and determination. And we've been working so far together efficiently. We wanted to have this day of September 16th around the issue of sustainable mobility and climate action. This is really the, a, a way to test our capacity for resilience. We are here together with several experts, several expert from mobility, the mobility sector, and I'm sure we will have a fruitful discussion. I would like to convey some messages. Of course, what is at stake in Africa is huge and urgent. There is demographic growth and economic growth that is just speeding up. As the president of Kodatu just mentioned, the challenges are concerning urban development, transportation, etc. The population will double to reach over 2 billion people. Of course, this is not without any challenges regarding climate, concerning social and territorial equity. I want to focus on three main topics just to show how in Africa we are um, acting in these fields in Senegal, the government chose to follow a track, a strategy, if you like, to promote green transport, inclusive transport, which are resilient to climate change. And we are acting on two particular axes, first on urban perimeters to align with the international commitments we are acting on social aspects on the promotion of uh, on green transport with low emissions we are also focusing on inclusive economy to increase our transport capacity we are expecting this trans regional train with an electricity uh, power and this is well on the way already we are expecting a lot in terms of performance to connect the city center to the suburbs and through this initiative we are also part of this effort in mobility until 2037 focusing on public transport so overall we want to reconcile the challenges of economic growth and environmental and societal issues. Secondly, on, at a national level, our purpose here is to favor um, development and transport on the whole territory will, with a multimodal system. We want to see a genuine economic transformation with low carbon. For most of the African countries and African cities, we need to articulate and reconcile the local scale and the national scale around transversal stakes. I'm talking about uh, 
uh, accelerating our reforms in order to integrate local governments, digital transformation, of course, with high expectations, and also energy transition, of course. I have focused on this just to say that this is a main challenge for the coming years. Europe is, is succeeding in this digital transition, and we are also on our way to do so. We need to do it now in order to protect our environment and our people. I'm sure we will be also talking about other issues to share best practices, to have the to have innovative funding systems and access to funding, especially in the private public partnership in terms of investments for our, in, our infrastructures and mobility systems. This is my message for today. And I want to thank Climate Chance, Kodatu, alongside with the CETUD, all of the organizers, all of the participants, and I'm hoping to see you all in person in Dakar in 2022. We also have the our opportunity of having Mr. Fayol with us, who is the Vice President of the European Investment Bank since 2015, who is in charge of climate and environment, who has been following the activities of the bank in several African countries. Mr. Fayol, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us. I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you from Luxembourg at the headquarters of the uh, Investment Bank at the European Union. I wish I could have been with you in Dakar. I do understand our constraints, health constraints at the moment. We are expecting you next year. Yes, indeed. I also wanted to say that I agreed with what President Dantex just said earlier on regarding the two main topics for today, the way that we will express our solidarity regarding the vaccines. For us, this is an extremely important topic. That's not, of course, the topic for today, but at the uh, European Investment Bank, just to let you know what we're doing, besides a large participation of European countries to the COVAX initiative. We have also developed vaccine production uh, with uh, uh, making of vaccines in, in Africa, in Senegal, for example. Some major decisions were made to finance projects to have a production of vaccine actually in Senegal or in Rwanda. The second topic which you mentioned regarding the economic recovery and the green recovery, and this is a key topic for us at the European Investment Bank, so I totally agree with what has been highlighted in your introduction. Our meeting is also important because it is, of course, taking place just before the Glasgow COP26. We have all come to realize that one of the main issues that the British want to raise at Glasgow is the adaptation, uh, issue of adaptation, how to manage the consequences, to deal with the consequences of climate change. Those who might have been doubting about this need for adaptation between the flooding, the the uh, fires, uh, heat waves, etc. We can see that there are no places in Europe or even in the world where we are uh, protected against the impact of climate change. This is even more so the case for Africa, which is a continent that is uh, less contributing to the climate issues and yet is suffering the most. And this coming decade, of course, is very important from the IPCC report to other reports. And of course, urban mobility will be at the heart of these discussions, especially urban mobility in Africa due to the demographic growth with a young population and their rapid urbanization on the African continent. 
for us, the green transition relying on good and affordable transport means is important to contribute to the development of resilient cities while not letting anyone aside. No one's left behind. Even in the case of a in the, uh, of infrastructures for pedestrians and soft mobility. At the uh, EIB, we have supported different projects for urban infrastructures in large cities, for like Le Caire, Cairo, Rabat, just to give you a few examples, of course, in Dakar as well, with the rapid transit bus system in Dakar that was implemented recently. For the last 10 years, we've had about 4 million euros. 4 million euros have been invested by the EIB for mobility in Africa, and about half of these 4 millions were dedicated to public transport. We will continue to speed up our investments. Transport and climate are important players. And, and as part of the European New Green Deal, with the various devices that have been implemented in Europe. As far as we're concerned at the EIB, we have developed a climate strategy that is very ambitious, and we are the first bank whose activities are aligned on the Paris Agreement, which means that we will now, from now on, take on board the impact of climate in all of our decisions. Now, regarding the coming years, coming decades, we know very well that the way we will develop our projects, we will develop transport systems. We will, there will be a lot of important changes in the technology, in the way that we develop these systems similar to what we did in the past. And we believe that it is time now to start thinking out of the box, to think in a more open way. We, if we want to reach our climatic climate goals, we will need innovation we will need innovation and we are not necessarily aware that these innovations will come but we know that they will come so we need to think out of the box if i may say of course needs in investment will be extremely important at the eib we are preparing the glasgow meetings and the follow-up of course which means three things for us having climate finance at the heart of our action and also uh, the development of green obligations but also the connections between the uh, european tax secondly we want to develop expertise and technical assistance we know this is going to be a key issue and we are doing so through the initiative of the Sustainable Cities in Africa. And we continue to develop these projects, which is why we are very glad to be able to be with you this morning. And I will end now by saying that for such an institution as ours, of course, partnerships are key to success. This is part of our DNA. We never do or carry out a project without partners. We have to find partners, both in the private and public sector. We know that we will need uh, to have all the supports necessary in the coming decades. Um, therefore, we are very glad to be able to work with the Global Center for Adaptation, with the African Bank for Development, uh, to 
contribute to development projects in Africa to amplify this development. And I will stop for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And to conclude our introduction, now we have the pleasure of hearing a recorded video from Mr. Nigel Topping, high level champion, climate champion from the UK just before the Glasgow meeting. I think it was important that we should hear him. Mr. Topping has the floor through this recorded video. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, I'm delighted to be making some opening remarks at the Climate Chance Annual Summit, especially as we approach COP26. I'd like to thank Climate Chance, Kodatu, uh, CTUD, but also the Senegalese government and the city of Dakar for hosting this virtually for now, but hopefully in person in 2022. And it is a real disappointment, I know, for many of us that um, we have to we're only able to meet virtually. I was really looking forward to visiting Senegal, but as I say, I'm really hopeful that I'll be able to be with you in person next year. Um, I think we've all learned since Paris that cities are the crucial nexus of different levels of government and pathways on climate change. It's where the most inspired leadership and courageous visionary action is required from both state and non-state actors. So Dakar, as a member of Cities Race to Zero, is one of nine cities on the African continent who've published their 1.5 degree aligned climate action plans. So let's get more African cities um, into the Race to Zero by COP26 to show leadership from the continent. Uh, we, we know that cities are crucial in the fight against climate change in so many different ways, from transport to how we green more spaces, in cities and, and how we plan cities to be more resilient to climate change. How we develop secure, clean, accessible water supplies for growing populations, especially those living in informal settlements who are often the most vulnerable to extreme weather events, um, such as heat stress, which we now know to be a climate threat for cities around the world. Of course, we know that Africa cities are growing at twice the global average and in 2050, we expect an additional 1 billion people to be living in African cities. It's an incredible statistic. So the need for buildings and infrastructure is only going to intensify. And construction, uh, both planned and underway in Africa, we know that Africa, 80% of the buildings needed in 2050 haven't been built yet. So there's an opportunity to build right from today to create green, green jobs, uh, green skills, green training, and sustainable growth through widespread green building and sustainable mobility in Africa. And to do this, African cities will need to be more proactively supported to enable the right forms of investment they are seeking to provide quality built environments and green transport routes. Uh, for example, recent analysis by the IFC found over $1.5 trillion in climate investment opportunities in sub-Saharan African cities alone, with the highest share, nearly half of that, in green buildings. And of course, it's not only construction that concerns us with cities. The CDP study this May found that one in four cities lack the funds to protect themselves from severe climate hazards like uh, heat stress, flooding and water shortages. So in this conference through the COMSA, you'll hear about the city's race to resilience campaign. The good news is that 65% of African cities already have a resilience and adaptation plan, including Lagos, the most popular city in Africa. And 82% of cities in Africa are taking actions to protect their people, including flood mapping, tree planting, and creating green spaces. What's needed now is the investment and private sector involvement to underpin and accelerate these plans. City and government leadership need to drive this process of drawing up investable plans with clear organised asset classes and to give potential investors the confidence to invest and wait for the returns to come. 
There's great innovation in this space already. In the US, cities are bundling packages of renewable energy to attract pension fund investment, for example. So I think that this conference represents the prestigious leadership needed to raise the ambition and action within cities for Glasgow and onward to COP27. So please, I'm looking forward to all of you showing us how to do it. Thank you. Merci. Merci pour... Uh... Thank you very much for this message. I think it's time now to move on to our first round table focused on mobility. And I give the floor to Françoise Rossignol, Vice President of Transport in the Taurus region in charge of international organisatrice de la mobilité and also a member so over to you Françoise indeed we were meant to be in Dakar and to be optimistic about this it gives us one more year to prepare this great conference which was planned for this week and we would like to take part in this and we were looking forward to this as an important moment to work on mobility in southern cities Codature has been organizing these kind of discussions for 40 years and it seems that we're at a crucial moment for the future of southern cities and their inhabitants for their development and also for the climate of the whole planet as the president mentioned. So we wanted to draw up a declaration for Dakar, which would be a roadmap. And we're going to try and work on some of these topics with various different people from major African cities, technicians and donors. And this will help us work with different social networks to continue preparing this conference in Dakar which we all hope will be exceptional. So before asking the questions to our speakers, as a local uh, elected representative and mayor, I would like to highlight the importance of the issues of governance and mobility, both in the North and the South. There's no universal model. We know there are constants without which we won't be able to build a system of efficient mobility. So we need to make, we need to divide up the skills clearly. We need specific authorities with a coherent spectra of all our different skills in an area of mobility for cities and around cities. And that's essential. We need sustainable funding to make sure the public transport system works and we need strategic planning to progressively improve the system which is supported by the politics and the technicians and that's absolutely essential that these people work together in france we are moving forward with these issues with laws going through for example with transport authorities these authorities have funding, particularly the mobility payments, which are paid by public and private employers. These are important tools and very specific to France, which may not be able to be used in other countries. So governance models are multiple, and these need to be adapted to each country. We are here to share our experience and to share our best practice. So now I would like to hand the floor to Mr. Jean Todd, the UN Ambassador for Road Safety. Madame Rossignol, thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me well. Hello, everybody. I'm in Paris and I'm delighted to be with you 
for this Climate Chance Africa Summit 2021. So I can highlight the role of mobility for the planet and for green, resilient and prosperous humanity. Thank you to Climate Chance and all the partners for supporting these discussions linked to COP21 and the Ambassador for Road Safety. So my aim is to guarantee safe and sustainable mobility. And it's worrying to see that it's been a decade of effort to reduce the number of deaths by half on the roads and seeing at the same time an increase. So why is this important for you? Each year, there are 1.4 million, million deaths on the road. Accidents on the road are in the same accidents of other worldwide problems, just like the pandemic that we've been going through with COVID-19. The first cause of death with young people, and that's our future. And this can have a positive impact on climate issues, the reduction of inequalities, sustainable cities, gender, and a lot of other areas. The area of transportation is responsible for 23% of CO2 emissions and the investment in safe mobility to change these trends and to reduce CO2 emissions by investing in public transport and in clean energy. In terms of economic challenges, road accidents can cost countries three to five percent of their GDP. Studies have shown that the economic profitability of investing in road safety is exponential. In addition, investing in green mobility for sustainable cities contributes to resilience in a post-COVID world. The quality and the security of our roads affects every citizen worldwide, every business and every country and needs concerted efforts and national decision makers and decision makers in cities need to respond quickly. The global health crisis has not only changed life in cities and also demand for mobility, but it's also increased existing inequalities. And that's one of the biggest similitudes between COVID-19 and road accidents. The most vulnerable people are the first victims. From 2021 to 2030, we are planning to reduce the number of victims to enable everybody to access safe and sustainable transport. I'm sure that we'll be able to reach this objective if we work together and in Africa, and that the reason of that is important. A significant part of injuries and deaths on the road are in Africa. Africa is on the rise in terms of transport, informal transport, and the use of two-wheel transport. So we need to put in road safety measures to improve the efficiency and which are adapted to these changes. And the good news is a lot of initiatives are already underway. For example, as a project funded by the UN Road Safety Fund, the Ethiopian government has therefore implemented policies to this end. The COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us that decarbonized mobility, like walking and biking, is more and more important. And I'm very enthusiastic to see the ambitions of Ethiopia to put in place pedestrian ways in different cities in the country. This is a successful approach and will be able to be shared with other countries in Africa. So when the world comes back to normal and the cities will be investing in recovery, we will see the positive effects of this investment. Another example, a collective effort here, both in terms of export and imports, to deal with second-hand car market in Africa. More than 45 million cars in Africa are currently in circulation, and 90% of those are second-hand imported cars. So a large part of these are not good quality cars, both in terms of environmental issues and safety issues. So we need the, the continent to have safer cars. So 15 countries in West Africa 
We've been working on this in this one of the most affected areas in the world, both in terms of environmental issues and road safety. Significant efforts have been made as well to encourage governments to adopt minimum road safety measures, particularly for helmets. Each citizen everywhere should have access to safe, ventilated and affordable helmets. A campaign has been launched and I hope that this will lead to essential changes in the area. We mustn't forget public transport as well. Cities where public transport is highly used have fewer accidents. So investing in public transport are investments for security. And these issues are seen as priorities in terms of strategic action plans in Africa after 2020 and for the second decade of action as well. And I hope this will be part of Dakar's declaration. And I wanted to say that I believe strongly that we need to work together to make collective commitments to create a safer, greener, more inclusive system. And you can count on me and I hope I can count on you. Thank you very much. I'm going to now go to Ouagadougou, where we'll be meeting Mr. Berwinde, who is the mayor of Ouagadougou. Are you with us? We can't hear you, I'm afraid. Yes, hello. Mr. Berwinde, you're mayor of the capital with 3 million inhabitants, whose demographic growth is over 7%, and whose public transport is at 1%. 65% of mechanized transport is by two-wheel transport. Yet Burkina Faso has just launched a very big mobility campaign, which will be changing these figures. There's a lot of ambitious projects which have not worked in the urban context, such as yours. So what are the crucial elements that make you think or make us think that this project will be successful? Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you for giving me this opportunity through this webinar. We would have liked to be in Dakar, but such is the pandemic, and we have to work through new technology. So I wanted to talk about this ambitious project for urban transport in Ouagadougou. And you were asking what the crucial elements were for this project. Firstly, given what my predecessor said, this needs to be successful because he talked about the issues in African cities. It's true that a lot of projects have failed in urban contexts, but just like Wakadugu system, which is unique, there's more than one reason why it's specific, though. This the project has a lot of political will behind it, both from the central state and from local government. In Africa, the failure of certain public policies can be explained by a lack of political will. And that is what required to get over these obstacles. In Ouagadougou, the Burkina state and the state, the local state, are aware of the issues of mobility in this city. And it's together that we've shown our willingness to end these dysfunction of the transport system, which everybody knows about. There's congestion, accidents, which cause hundreds of deaths every day in the capital. The issues of distancing, the increasing costs of transport for households, and of course, air pollution generated by vehicles. And that's both two-wheelers and four-wheeler vehicles. Often, 
the fuel is very bad quality as well, which adds to this. And we should say that this project in Ouagadougou is not just about acquiring buses. It's a revolution of a transport system, and this aims moving from individual to collective transport. Ouagadougou is often seen as the capital of two wheelers. So we need to transfer the collective transport mode and the to move away from an individual mode of transport. So we have different parts of this project. Firstly, we have a network of buses through the acquisition of different sizes of buses. It could be 18 meter articulated buses, 15 meter buses, and 13 meter buses, and also nine meter buses. And then we have technical assistance and capacity building of institutional actors, which will lead to an, an authority which will be organizing this network. And thirdly, we'll be setting up spaces and with dedicated equipment so that these buses can circulate within the traffic. And we'll be developing a local subsidiary to produce biofuel because these buses will be able to use the biofuel that we can produce. It'll be managed as well by this organization authority. So for us, it's moving away from this chaotic, unsustainable system by providing not just buses, but a global solution to mobility in our living space. So WAGA's mobility project has been designed with players who are skilled, experienced. There's Scania, Scania West Africa, LTD, and the RATP Corporation, which have decades of experience among them and have a solid reputation. The first operator, has very high quality material. And the second, RATP Corporation, is going to help us to produce a high quality plan and high quality management of this network. The RATP is fundamental in terms of what it's going to enable to do and what it will enable us to correct in terms of our collective transport. And the third generation of, of installation of collective transport. So for us, this project moves away from the beaten track and should succeed and improve facilities for inhabitants in Greater Ouagadougou. It's just started, but as people said earlier, we continue to call on the support of financial partners so that this project can have a high impact for the city of Ouagadougou. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I see that Madame Kwesi is online. She's the director of the African Observatory for Mobility based in Abidjan. Madame Kwesi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello, everybody. So what are the changes and trends that you can see at the moment, that's my first question in terms of mobility in African cities. And can you give us some practical examples which are particularly innovative or effective? We'd be delighted to hear from you. Over to you, Madame Kwesi. Thank you, Madame Rossignol. Thank you to Climate Chance Kodetru for the organization of this virtual summit. And we all hope that we'll be able to meet in Dakar next year, of course. I'm going to go over this very quickly. It won't be an exhaustive list because we don't have enough time. But I would like to highlight a first point. For the last few years, we've seen that digitization working towards mobility 
and sustainable mobility. But what we've seen since some time is that this is used to integrate different actors and particularly those who are at the heart of the system, such as drivers with mechanisms which help integrate, whether at a social, economic or financial uh, way, with support for these drivers, whether it's for taking out insurance or savings or loans, or also support to build capacity and to renew their fleets of taxis. So that's quite an interesting thing to see. We've also seen the development of some great applications. When I talk about super applications, I'm talking about a platform which might bring together different services to meet wider needs of the populations. And that enables us to widen, broaden the range, like with payment, delivery, uh, talking about food, it could be shopping. There's a wallet as well, an elect electronic wallet, which enables people to manage their expenses. And the aim of all this is to improve users' everyday experience at a private level. There are also solutions which have come about through the COVID crisis to reorientate business strategies, not towards users, but B2B, so towards businesses. And this shows the, the resilience of these solutions and how responsive they can be at a local level. At a national level, as Sibia, uh, as the mayor of Ouagadougou told us, we're working on the public transport offer in different cities, whether in terms of modes of transport, because cities are moving more and more towards capacity services. We also have systems to support uh, passengers or to support fleets and to structure the informal sector, which today is the majority and predominant in these cities. And it's very encouraging from a climate perspective to see multiple projects investing in moving towards electric fleets, whether taxis or vehicles, with policies moving towards that, supported by NGOs or the government at a local level, particularly with the arrival of capacities like BRTs, the metros and light rail. Alongside this, stakeholders are coming together to think more and more about going beyond mapping of transport networks. So how can we go beyond that kind of thinking by offering and creating tools which are high impact for local populations and for transport operators in order to give us a better visibility on traffic, on tools, on transport modes, on vehicles in cities. We're also looking at the law against importing vehicles into Africa. Certain countries have set up laws and limits in terms of age for these imports of second-hand cars. But unfortunately, these laws currently have not had the impact that we wanted for certain reasons. And we can still see very high levels of dangerous pollution. So standards need to be put in place for vehicles, but there's an underlying issue, which for me has not been dealt with enough, which is uh, dealing with um, high pollution fuel, 
which have very high levels of sulfur. Even with new uh, fleets of vehicles or the latest generation vehicles, we will not be able to reduce greenhouse gases. So we need to think about different modes to reduce travel within cities and move towards cleaner energy with zero emissions. And finally, we can also see an increasing number, or we will be seeing uh, greener forms of transport within city strategies, so particularly non-motorized transport. Pilot projects coming through, a lot of initiatives as well at an individual level. And in the private sector, we have corridors for pedestrians and bikes coming up. And we also have free for use bikes as well. So thank you very much for calling on the African Observatory for Mobility. And we do hope that we'll be able to see each other in Dakar next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Kwesi. I can see that Mr. Kadim Sisse is here. He is the Director of Studies and Strategy at CETRUD, which is the Authority of Transport for the City of Dakar and represented on the board of CODETRU. So Dakar's mobility plan is being drawn up. Could you tell us some of the main details of this so that this plan will have a, a concrete impact on the city in the future. Mr. Karim Sisse, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, Madame Rossignol. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. And I'm going to try and go over this quite quickly. I know we're a little bit late. So the urban mobility plan in Dakar is being drawn up currently. And I would just like to remind you that the CITRUD already has a planning document for, and this was done in 2007, and that was running from 2008 to 2025. And we decided to update it and come up with a new plan because we have different vectors to include. So the main principles which have been retained, even though this is being drawn up, the first one is a multimodal plan focusing on public transport in particular, because we need to increase the offer of public transport to improve access within Dakar through adapted pricing. Another principle is to continue setting up a, a capacity offer. So the principle here is to continue with this, to move towards a transport network, a mass transport network, and to increase the public transport capacity and reduce the individual modes of transport. An important principle as well is to take active modes into account better, because these are 60-70% of transport modes, so it's important to take this into account and not to reduce that, because this mode of transport is not doesn't cause pollution. Another thing we wanted to encourage is the use of bikes, which is very low at the moment in Dakar. We would like, through this plan, to encourage the use of bikes with facilities and encouragement. We want to manage traffic better as well through this plan, because congestion is very significant in Dakar today. And this has an impact on economic development in terms of wasted time and also increased pollution. We've seen in the Innovation Awards, there is a innovation work within this area. And through this traffic management, we want to take road safety into account better. As we heard earlier, from the ambassador. 
So to better manage traffic and public transport, and with these two areas, we think we can take action on road safety. Another issue is parking. We would like to set up a policy, which we don't have at the moment, in coordination with the other stakeholders, particularly local authorities, of course. And one of the last principles is an environmental transition. So using less polluting public transport through cleaner, greener technology. And we're working on restructuring the network today to be less based on gas and moving towards electric transport. And this is very important because there's an, a trend of mass mobility as a service which is coming into play. So there are the main principles of our urban mobility plan in DECA, which we're currently developing, and which is quite far forward already. And we think we'll be able to share the results of this with you next year during the week in September. Thank you very much. Yes, we can see this is part of the city's overall plan. And we look forward to getting news on this next year. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn to Madame Lise Breul, who is the head of transport and mobility at the French Development Agency, who supports a lot of cities in the south to help fund their transport systems. So, Madame Breuil, can you hear me? Yes, very well. And we can hear you too. So the institution that you represent, the French Development Agency, helps a number of countries, particularly African countries. They fund core transportation projects in Dakar, Abidjan, and elsewhere, and other modes of transport, which are less, with less consumption, taxis, buses, which can contribute to improving living conditions in these cities. So in how or what is AFD's position on these topics and, and how does it support these different modes of transport? Hello, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for this question, which is the right question for the different modes of transport in a city in terms of how you construct a system. And the word system is important because we want an efficient system with low in carbon and inclusive. And what you say and the reality is us as donors who works with a system of loans, we're often requested uh, because of these capacity modes, which are very expensive. So we're often helping with corridors or lines, or maybe we'll be funding uh, uh, trains in Morocco, Metro in Dakar, or the, uh, the train in, uh, in Dakar as well, the BRTs in Abidjan, in Lagos, Dar es Salaam. But we've done the same diagnostic as you, and same assessment. And what we want is to move towards other components in the system, for example, as we've often talked about this, professionalizing artisanal transport or investment for active modes. The idea is to recognize the fundamental issue is that walking is over 60-70% of, uh, of all transport in cities and so we need to work on these different areas. We also need to recognize the huge impact that this can have on greenhouse gas emissions, air quality, road safety, or safety in cities, and accessibility. So what do we do? The first thing we do is to give an overall vision by funding, along with other partners, sustainable urban mobility plans with a, partners, a partnership with Mobilize Your City, with whom we work with Dakar. And that's very important because this builds advocacy with public uh, authorities. And sometimes these people are attracted by the bigger projects rather than the smaller artisanal projects. So 
it's important to see how these link and to convince that it's important to invest in these areas. Secondly, what we do at AFD is to always have an artisanal and active mode transport to accompany these major projects, which is the heart of our work. Like in Dakar, where we have funded the training system in Dakar, and in addition to that, we're developing core bus system, which will link the buses and the trains. And we're thinking also through the support and updating and professionalizing artisanal transport modes. We've also built uh, in other areas, um, bus, uh, bus stations and then different links to that. And the third part, which is important, what we do in medium sized cities, and that's slightly more difficult because there's not any capacity transport. It's not necessarily very relevant. And we have few means, but here we try to have a program with different levels of investment and to find grants to target technical assistance in these issues, which have a low cost and a high impact, so a very good value. So to conclude, what I'd like to say is that the difficulty we have in intervening in these other parts of the mobility system is to find people to carry these projects forward who are going to think of both mobility, not just infrastructure, because when you want to professionalize artisanal transport systems, which integrate a whole host of private stakeholders, it's very complicated, very sensitive issues. So we need a public transport authority with a system with pub political support as well. And this is the case of CETUD. And they're very exemplary in terms of their uh, role in African transport. So we hope to be able to move forward with CODECQ and other actors, particularly in terms of Mobilize Your Cities program. And I'd like to thank you very much for inviting us here today to this round table. And we hope to see you next year in Dakar. Thank you very much, Madame Brun. As you said, we hope to go further with this. We hope to move towards 2022 in Dakar. And in the meantime, we will be able to continue discussing these very interesting issues. I'd like to thank all the different speakers for the quality of their contributions, which should enable us to continue working on our CODETU workshops to draw up this Dakar Declaration. So we'll see you in 2022. And please don't hesitate to come and contribute towards this work. Thank you very much to all of you. And thank you to all the participants. Merci à tous. Wow. Thank you, everyone. Thank Sorry for uh, going over time. We will reorganize our program now, so we will not frustrate anyone in this program. Moving on to roundtable number two regarding local action. Afrique. Moderated Merci. by Mr. Mbassi, General Secretary of the EU at UCLG. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. The floor is yours. Uh, ouais. All right. Ça va? Okay. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Can you all hear me? Yes. Very well. Uh, bonjour à toutes et à Hello, tous. everyone. My name is Jean-Pierre Elong Mbassi, General. Secretary General of the UCLG Africa, which represents the local municipalities, authorities on the continent, our headquarters. I was asked to moderate the second roundtable for climate change 
summit regarding local action. The question that is therefore raised is how can effective decentralization and vertical integration accelerate the implementation of climate and local development policies and actions? In order to answer this question, we have 30 minutes. The organizers have gathered representing various actors involved in climate action which means that every speaker will have two to three minutes. Our panelists, and I hope they will all make themselves known, we have Mrs. Zenua Sekta from Women Environmental Program in Burkina Faso, Mr. Sekusa, Director of Enda Energy, Mr. Gilles Vermont de Roche, Corporate Citizenship Senior Vice President of Schneider Electric, Honorable Tunji Bello, Honorable Commissioner for the Environment and Water Resources of, at the State of Lagos, Mr. Baba Drami, Ministry of Environment from Senegal, DEC, DEEC, Mr. El Ajengai, the reference city, the reference for Comsa at City of Dakar. And finally, Mr. Aliusal, president of the Association of Mayors of Senegal. Due to our limited time, I would ask all of you to, on your behalf, I'm going to, on your behalf, thank all the organizers of this uh, day from Glasgow to Dakar 27. What? priorities for climate action and sustainable mobility in Africa. Once I have done this on your behalf, I'm now gonna ask our panelists just to skip all the thanks and to go straight to the purpose. Mr. President Aliusal, I'm gonna start with you. In three minutes, could you tell us how the Mayor Association in Senegal has been supporting the Senegalese cities in taking on board the climate issues in their policies. The floor is yours. Mr. Aliusal. Thank you. The Association of Mayors of Senegal is highly sensitive to the climate issues supported in this by our network and our program uh, with the UCLG and the local authorities membership. We are also part of a network and working in cooperation with the preparation uh, for the Summit for Water. So, through all these connections, we are very sensitive, therefore, when it comes to climate issues. And this is impacting our relationship with all of our members from all the cities in Senegal as a beneficiary of uh, territorial authorities. We have a program and the principles of this program is highlighting the climate issues like adaptation, climate change, and it's up to the Association of Mayors to promote, of course, these trends in the various development programs and policies. In the last few weeks, in Dakar, in our region, we, we have experienced changes in the public transport. This is our topic, of course. We've had some disturbances. We've had some riots after some floodings, for example. I think these difficulties are just showing that our topic really shows that it's important to have synergy between what we plan at a national level, large-scale 
plans and local action as part of this crisis which we are experiencing at the moment in the greater Dhaka, there is a necessity to have a connection between national stakeholders and actors and local actors so that together we can understand what are the climate challenges and we can so we can act together accordingly in Senegal, like in many countries, it is this environmental issue is being transferred, whereas the uh, civil protection issue is not transferred. Impact of climate change, mainly floodings in our case, this is part of the environmental issues, but also civil protection. We've seen hundreds of families forced to move because they could no longer live in flooded areas, houses. This is a practical example showing the need to involve local governance and, all, and in such large scale projects, such projects which have an impact. Such as the BRT, these will have an impact. The environment of these uh, municipalities, therefore, this is at the heart of our climate sensitivity, but we want to be also a state actor as a association of the mayors to be able to discuss with the government and with all the cooperation agencies, we have already started a dialogue with the EU, and we hope to be a key players on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Alusal. Yes, I can see that there needs to be some coherence. Uh, as you said, civil protection is not decentralized, for example, when there is flooding, this could be a problem. I think what you're saying is right, partnership and vertical integration between the national and the territorial levels is key for a successful public action. Moving on to Mr. El Ajindindiai. You are the uh, Comsa reference city of Dakar for climate and energy in sub-Saharan Africa. It is important to say, as we've just heard, that to, to make sure that the vertical articulation is done between the various levels of governance, but it is also important to include all the actors from the civil society in the uh, conception of the climate plan in cities. How did you go about integrating the various the various stakeholders of the civil society in the energy climate plan in Dakar? And is this pl plan aligned to the NDCs? Thank you very much. I believe that as far as Dakar City is concerned, for the last 10 years, since 2011, Dakar has been involved in this in order to take on board issues with planification, environmental issues, and also planification around climate issues. As part of the energy territorial uh, action plan, we have the municipality, the council. In 2007, uh, we had the authorization to sign the uh, convention of mayors and to accept the EU subvention grant. And therefore, we were able to, to have a good governance framework. We have, as I said, the Conseil Municipal, which is the municipality authority, and also the implementation of tools like a steering 
group headed by the mayor, which played an important role by stimulating awareness on climate issues with technical support as well, or the green reference, as we call, to oversee these actions. We're talking about alignment and coherence. In this pilot scheme, there are uh, technical agents, representatives of some directorates, among which the Environmental Directorate, which is what we call vertical co cooperation. We understood this from the lesson learned. We have seen that this coherence is and alignment is so important as part of phase three of Come SSA. We have increased the steering committee including other ministries. This is also true. There are state services like the Development Agency, the National Agency for Territorial Development to have co coherence in our actions. What was at stake for our elected members was to understand the various topics addressed and the communication to the population. We're also talking about the organization of civil society for Dakar. This was an important axis as we developed our project with the implication of the population and the citizens. And we also had to consult our citizens in order to take on board the way that the population would perceive our vulnerability to climate changes. This was an inclusive approach, which we highlighted in all of our actions. We wanted to include all the stakeholders at every step of the preparation, all the way to the implementation of the project. Just to give you some details of this citizen consultation, we had 500 people who were consulted in the various municipalities around Dakar. In these 19 municipalities, we had 19 focus groups, which were popular meetings in each of these municipalities in order to strengthen the mobilization of the population around the issues of climate. Population of Dakar is mainly made up of young people and women. We've had to involve them in the preparation process through forums, citizen debates, TV shows, with sports and cultural associations. All the people from Dakar know about this. We've had women in each municipality who acted as a go-between the population and the authority, which shows that women and young people were very much involved and were sensitive to the climate changes and to the environmental issues, we were able to develop eco-citizen actions in some highly populated municipalities. In the steering group, we also had this platform to show that we were inclusive the great innovation in Dakar was the implementation of the platform, which is a Dakar platform for action for climate. This was made up of about 50 members. From basic organizations, non-state organizations, 
circular, the micro involved in circular economy, renewable energy, etc. This was an important player in building this this plan. Thank you, Mr. Ndia. Very interesting, very interesting. Often we quote Dakar as a reference for leading the climate agenda in African cities. And we follow what you are doing very closely. And I hope that the projects that have been developed will be funded. I'm sure you are you have raised much expectation among the population, and these expectations need to be met. And I'm sure the city of Dakar alone cannot meet all these challenges and mobilize all the necessary resources to fulfill its action plan. But the fact that all the population is involved is a, an important point to get funding. Mr. Baba Drame, as a director at the Ministry of Environment, DEEC, you have the responsibility to make sure that the NDCs include the climate action at the territorial level. And secondly, that these are implemented locally. As you know, we are expecting in Glasgow the proposals for uh, revising the NDCs. Can you tell us how you went about a consultation between the local and the national level to take on board these two concerns and how the new NDC in Senegal is including the local action plan dimension. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mbassi. Thank you for giving me the floor. La question est très, très intéressante. It's a very interesting question. And first of all, I would like to say that Senegal, as part of its climate policy, has always emphasized important principles, putting local authorities and government at the heart of our action as part of the bilateral agreement. Thinking local, global thinking and local acting is a structuring principle. Mr. Aliusal, the president of the Association of Mayors, today in our policy, environmental policy, we have local policies because environment is a transferred competence. Now, regarding climate policy, I have to say that since the signature of the uh, framework convention, the UNFCCC, after the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, Senegal has always chosen a close implication of local territories, first on the institutional and then operational levels for the implementation of projects to adapt to climate changes, to reduce gas emissions. Should I remind you that the first case of consultation that the Senegalese government implemented, we were able to include all the stakeholders, people working on local development projects, the Association of Mayors at the time, we also had a, an association of regional presidents. Anyway, our purpose is not only to share information regarding climate with the various uh, leaders, but also to see how the technical services from the government can support them in including those issues 
for local development and local action plan. In Senegal, we have a planification on two levels, national planification, but also local planification. Since the climate issues can be felt at a territory level, it's very important for us if we want to have a greater impact to not just focus on a at a national level, but to have local actors involved in this process. Recently, in order to reinforce this dynamics of decentralization, our government implemented regional committees for climate change, which are um, respondents at the territorial level. The purpose of these committees is to support local territories or local authorities to help municipalities and local governments to include climate policies in the planification of uh, local development and to submit projects for applying for multilateral funding as part of the climate policy at the multilateral level. Mr. President, these are strong actions which the Senegalese government developed, as you rightly said, as part of this NDCs, which is a basic reference for implementing our policies, most of the projects that have been identified, as, whether it be for adaptation or mitigation, we have a basis at a local level. The general director of the CETUD is aware of this. If you look at the BRT projects, this is a program which success depends on the involvement of local authorities. Mr. Mayor spoke earlier on, talked about the flooding issues. These issues need to be tackled, which is why the President of the Republic is seeking efficient solutions and has departmentalized the territories that belong to another local authority. Just to say, Mr. President, that in Senegal, the state has adopted a measure of strong implication of local authorities as part of the climate policies and our resources targeted for the implementation of these projects. The $13 billion part of this envelope is for local actions that will have an impact for local municipalities, local authorities to improve the well being of our populations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very interesting indeed. As I said, Senegal is often quoted as an example, a model to be followed. And I hope that in Glasgow, you will make your voice heard on behalf of the African group and to say what you have just expressed to promote what you're doing in Senegal. To go to you, Honorable Commissioner Tunji Bello. If you are, are you there? Commissioner, you are, the, you are here? Yeah. Okay. So can you tell us how Lagos State Administration is managing the reconciliation between development challenges and climate change challenges in an environment characterized by a high pace of urban growth with an additional population estimated at around 300,000 to 500,000 per year. So in such a context, uh, are you, can you uh, or are you interested in the implementation of the UNCCC 
campaign on race to zero emission and race to resilience? And if so, how does it translate in the policy of Lagos State? Thank I'm you sorry, very it's, very, it's dense, but uh, you have, uh, let's say, well, I'll give you five minutes to... to Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I must say I'm very happy to, uh, to be here, but here to represent uh, our governor, the governor of Lagos, Mr. Bajide Sawolu. And, uh, and I wish uh, we'll get uh, the best out of the, this uh, conference. Thank you very much. And let me respond to your question, Mr. Siali. You know, Lagos is the most populous in Nigeria. It used to be the former capital city now, and it's the most popular, but it's the, in terms of land mass, it's the smallest. It's less than 1% of Nigeria. That means that it's just less than 4,000 square kilometers of the entire Nigeria, Nigeria's land mass. That is less than 1%. And we have, it's the most urbanized, as an industrial city, and also the most populous. We have a population of over 22 million people in Lagos alone. And you can see, you can, you can look at the effect of that in the, in the, on, on, in the, in the total uh, environment, in terms of congestion, in terms of uh, uh, transportation, in terms of emissions, differently. So we have been trying to battle with that. And, and I must remark one thing. We first realized that we need to start the process of climate change. And we started this as far back as uh, 2009, when we started the climate change conference in, uh, in, in Lagos. And Lagos is the first uh, state in Nigeria to have started that, to be very conscious of the fact we mobilize people and so on. In fact, this year, we just, we just launched our climate change action plan. But let me come, quickly come back to your question. Because of uh, the nature of our city and so on, because of the urban congestion, because of so much, so much emission that we're having and so on. So we have decided to look to... We are losing you. Commissioner, we are losing you. Reform our transportation system. We have we are marked about five uh, was planned as far back as now. We have the blue line. And... Forty kilometers. Um, we have a problem yes. with the commissioner. Do you, do, do, do you hear us, commissioner? I can hear you. Can so, you hear me? So, yeah, 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 proceed now. Okay, sorry. I was saying that we have about five different rail lines which we have planned since 2004. We have, we have, been, we have, we have we, we started one in, in 2009 and we just started another one just last year is the red line. We are doing the red and the blue line. The, uh, the blue line is on the west corridor and the, uh, the red line is on the uh, central corridor of Lagos. We transport people. Um, uh, hmm. Hmm. Again, uh, thousands of people on a daily basis, five kilometers north of the, at, at the Atlantic Ocean. Out of our process of reducing emission and so on. The blue line is already in progress and it's also going to be completed. And these are part of the progress to reduce the, the number of buses you put on the road, the number of cars that people put on the road. And I think that in, 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 in the long term, We've got difficulties following you. Who assist us in reducing a lot of emissions and a lot of uh, diseases that we see across the city. But also, I mean, I mean, we are planting it and so on. We are, we are, I mean, we, we have a, I mean, an organization called Last Park, Legacy Parks and Garden Agency, which is already working on, on uh, trying to green most of the, uh, most of the roots already. We have planted about 10 million trees since 2009, since 2009 we started. We have about two, over 10 million trees in Lagos now that we have planted. And so that's the, the process is continuous exercise, which we are doing, and which we will continue to do uh, across, across Lagos. And this is a major task 
we are taking up all the, all, all the open spaces that we can find now to be able to green them. This is part of our process, or this part of the process of reducing emission across Lagos. Thank you uh, for this uh, input. Uh, as, as you know, it raises a lot of uh, uh, interest because, uh, of course, Lagos is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you call it a city of excellence, and uh, we call it a, a city of challenges. And uh, I think it is important that the reflection on uh, the way Lagos is addressing the issue of climate change and the choices in uh, the development will determine to a large extent how Africa will be addressing the same. So it is important that we follow what is happening in Lagos and will encourage you to continue doing the good, the good work that you are doing. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to turn to the private sector, Mr. Gilbert Mouderoche. How does Schneider Electric go about getting involved in climate change in their territories where Schneider Electric is working? We know that most of the companies have been asked to implement environment and societal and governance policies. Could you give us some example uh, in which your company has helped the territories and cities to lead the energy transition? Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Jean uh, no, no, thanks. As we said earlier, Schneider Electric, uh, looking at these topics that we've been discussing this, this morning, we have two challenges and three topics. Of course, we've just talked about Lagos and large cities in Africa of several million of people. 20, 25 million people, million people. When we talk about Lagos, Cairo, Kinshasa, etc., there is a big issue regarding these large cities. Urbanization and urbanization and energy, all these issues, of course. A second topic, which is also key, is the emergence of cities in rural areas, we're going to have about 5,000 cities of over 30,000 people in Africa that should not be abandoned behind those large cities. And a third topic, which is also very interesting, when we look at figures, we agree that half of the population, la moitié de la population mondiale of the world population, of, sorry, of the African population, is now living in cities, but it means that half of the African population is also living in villages. As Schneider Electric, with the three main challenges in the African regions, of course, in different and various ways, as Schneider Electric, we are addressing different questions regarding energy challenges. Most probably, Africa will have to be the place uh, where we will be inventing ways of producing energy in the future. The second topic relates to training, which will be necessary. How do we address this particular topic? I'm going to talk about the rural area, which we don't talk about often enough, the agricultural issue is of course key not only for feeding people one third of people in africa live out of agriculture i would say in senegal for example we can talk about those villages in senegal where schneider electric has been contributing and helping building mini grids between 20 to 200 20 to 100 kilowatt to have a better life for the population to have a better life and to 
keep uh, uh, the the waters pr uh, Senegalese people eat a lot of onions, for example, sans conservation, quand without ils... conservation, when, when onions are sold at a very low price, which do not enable farmers to live out of this harvest or to keep those harvests for their own purposes, then they would have prices decreasing. For example, Schneider Electric has been involved in a very practical action uh, by building mini grids, renewable mini grids, and also building places to keep the onions to make a better living for people and to ensure a more equitable access to a better paid em uh, work, employment, and a better price guaranteed. Yesterday, we were in another village in Ivory Coast, Donbag. We also uh, developed a mini grid there for local communities. And they are able, therefore, to develop a cooperative activity. We could give you thousands of examples. Three main topics, energy in large cities, supporting the emergence of smaller cities in the rural areas, and the agricultural and village connection. Uh, half of Africa stays in the villages where they need to be living decently with economic support. When we look at new technologies with renewable mini grids, for example, that you can uh, steer remotely, and we look at the good functioning of all these devices, then there is an approach as a conclusion, I would say that this can only work if all the countries mobilize for training. Africa has enough electricians for at least Et donc on most voit of bien the population to access electricity. There is really a necessity to train people so that they can live out of their skills. This should not be the last uh, will. It should not be the last thing to do to train people. It should not be our, it is not our last resort either. As Schneider Electric, we have decided to keep on training young electricians along with the training. Uh, many young people will be facing the challenges of the future and the, and the prosperity of their countries in the future. We cannot talk about prosperity and future development without talking about training and training the young people, especially in Africa. Merci, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilles Vermont de Roche, for your input. I think that was very clear. You reminded us what we should never forget. Yeah, that if half of the people live in cities, it means that half of the population also lives in the country and that we need to improve living conditions where people live. The private, private sector can help in that sense. You have given us some very clear examples. And we would like to make sure that these examples can be known across the continent. And we will do our part to make sure that these examples and this kind of information is conveyed. We would invite you to join the electricity summit that will take place next year in a medium-sized city in Kenya share about your experience and maybe expose other cities, African cities, to such an experience. Thank you once again. I would like now to hand the floor to someone 
beaucoup euh, with whom I have worked a lot in the past and I hope to be able to continue working with him Mr Sekousar with your colleague Madame Asatou Diouf who is in charge of the advocacy at Enda Energy as experts for the climate change agenda. Mr. Gilles Vermont Desroches just said, what have been, or what are the three challenges and the three main action plans carried out by Schneider Electric in order to meet the challenges of climate emergency and climate action, local action in Africa. According to you, what are the main challenging, the main challenges, sorry, facing African populations and what kind of action and what will be the priority in action for climate action to be upscaled in the cities and territories of the African uh, continent. Uh, Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. It's a great joy to be here with you uh, as part of this panel, made up of political leaders and leaders of the private sector. How are decision makers, political decision makers at a national and local level along with the private sector and civil society how can we all work together in partnership one of the first challenges talking about this topic when we talk about vertical integration we talk about the appropriation of the ndcs in africa i think this is an important aspect getting hold of the NDCs in Africa, we have two main components, adaptation on the one hand, mitigation on the other hand. As African actors, we are trying to encourage the issues of adaptation. And we cannot, of course, escape the issue of gas emission reduction and mitigation to take part in this effort. In fact, speaking, what we are seeing as civil society organizers is that we need to steer our adaptation measures at a local level with another aspect, which would be to reduce gas emissions for lower carbon in NGO like Ender Energy involved in environmental issues in Africa, our position is to look at the interface between those various scales to see how to translate global actions to local actions. Our first action in action structural to be a stru stru structuring action regarding information, training, communication, communication, dissensitive. We need to have a critical mass of citizens who can really understand the various challenges. We're talking about various aspects of transition, like energy transition, ecological transition, economic transition, the energy transition, is focusing on long-term or sustainable services. That's the first level for which the various civil society organizations have to focus. The second level climate action is technical support and ENDA, like others, is here to support, to help territorial authorities to bring tools and methodology towards planification, sensitive planifications to climate, to energy. As we just heard, and also 
To give an example, the president of the Association of Mayors of Senegal explained through intercommunality. I'm emphasizing this because when we talk about territorial authorities, if we take them separately, it would be difficult to reach ambitious climate action, which is why we are promoting the intercommunality, intermunicipality actions, if you like, to mutualize efforts, resources, to have more impactful climate action. Just to give you an example, we are supporting various cities as part of the COM SSA. We are also supporting and accompanying other inter-municipality to help them develop a portfolio of projects for adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. This is an important message that shows how partners can get together to join such dynamics in investment. The third aspect is regarding the transfer of technology. We want to be able to transfer modern technology between South and South territories, but transfer of technology in general, talking about local knowledge, how to promote the development of these of this knowledge so that people can get hold of this knowledge, which doesn't cost a lot of money. We need to be able to work on how to promote the exchange of this knowledge, how to include local knowledge in development as part of the technological transfer. Mr. President, as we are facing many more hazards, we talked about floodings, drought, etc. We need to institutionalize also loss and damage as part of climate justice. We are talking about COP26 as non-state actors. We need to be able to carry out this advocacy to take on board local knowledge in order to develop greater cooperation between the South and the South. As part of our portfolio, we have also developed an integrated climate program. We call it a resilient program in the north of Senegal, made up of complementary aspects, access to energy services for water management, access to climate data, and access to market. In what we are doing as part of ENDA Energy is to try to tackle this kind of integrated approach and using energy transition as an open door relying on the various chain of values in the various territories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sekusar, for your input. You mentioned three challenges, the, pop, the appropriation of the NDCs, uh, technical transfer and local knowledge. And yeah, local technologies. I don't know if Mrs. Senadu Segda, she has a technical problem apparently, so she's not with us. So I think we are over time already by five minutes. Therefore, in order to keep on track with our program, I just want to end by saying thank you to all our panelists and thank you for the discipline. They actually respected the time that they were given. I'm sorry 
for those that I had to uh, limit the issue of decentralization should not be limited to cities, but should include all the territories and local governments. There is room to make sure that all actors to contribute. We saw the example of Schneider Electric and Enda, which are very much at the heart of our concerns. And we can see how large cities such as Lagos are really fighting to meet those challenges. I would invite everybody to say that the technological packages which we have been able to develop in smaller cities uh, for these packages to be useful also for larger cities which have to deal with large populations growing fastly. Which probably will need to resort to decentralized decisions and systems. And um, these large cities are often organized in a central way. There are there are questions to be addressed in the way that we need to address some issues, such as uh, public service. We cannot, for example, condemn the population of Kinshasa to have good services for a water ser service. Mr. Gilles Vermont de Roche, Mr and others who have responsibilities in those large territories. I think we all need to sit around the table and get to work together with Climate Chance to mobilize our strengths to find true solution. And I hope that COP26 will give us the opportunity to address such issues as sanitation and others. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Without further ado, we will now move on to the next round table, moderated by Emily Mabera. Thank you. Qui est un réseau international de collectivités locales dédié à la promotion de solutions de financement pour le développement urbain et le développement local. Alors, je suis très heureuse de modérer cette session sur l'accès au financement pour l'action climat et une mobilité durable à l'échelle locale en Afrique. Donc, on l'a entendu dans toutes les précédentes interventions, la question du financement, la transition climat au niveau local. C'est une des questions clés pour la, ré la réussite de la mise en œuvre euh, de l'accord de Paris, en particulier dans le contexte africain, du fait de la très forte croissance urbaine en, en cours. Euh, Monsieur Nigel, Nigel Topping, le champion de haut niveau de la COP, euh, a présenté tout à l'heure un chiffre extrêmement éloquent. Donc, on estime qu'il faudra euh, 1 500 milliards de dollars euh, d'investissement climat dans les villes d'Afrique subsaharienne. Or, une partie de ces villes n'existe pas encore. Et donc, il faudra financer et construire sur le continent plus de villes et d'infrastructures que ce qui a été construit en Chine jusqu'à ce jour. Donc, c'est un enjeu vraiment majeur. Et la difficulté est qu'il existe une défaillance de marché aujourd'hui entre l'offre de financement qui est disponible, et qui est mise en place notamment par les partenaires techniques et financiers, et la capacité des acteurs locaux et des collectivités locales à mobiliser ces financements. Euh, C'est encore plus vrai euh, pour euh, financer euh, l'adaptation au changement climatique et la résilience euh, urbaine. Donc, euh, dans cette table ronde, nous échangerons sur les solutions pour connecter cette offre et cette demande et faire sauter les verrous, comme le disait M. Ronan Dantec, le président de Climate Chess, en introduction. Donc, euh, je suis très heureuse aujourd'hui d'accueillir euh, des représentants d'institutions de financement du développement et euh, de banques commerciales pour traiter cette question. 
Et comme nous avons pris du retard, euh, on m'a demandé euh, que vos réponses euh, à cette question durent trois minutes. Donc, je vais vous demander, euh, si vous le voulez bien, quelles sont d'une part les stratégies et les solutions que vous déployez et d'autre part, quelles sont vos recommandations pour renforcer l'accès au financement climat à l'échelle locale en Afrique donc, on va d'abord accueillir M. Aurelio Menendez, qui est manager de l'Agence de la Banque mondiale du Sénégal. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. Merci beaucoup. Je vais parler en, en anglais pour être more, more efficace. So, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let me first thank the Chetud, Kodatu, and Climate Change for organizing this high-level event. I think it's very critical and important at this moment in, in how the world is evolving. And um, also like to greet my fellow panelists, uh, very honored to participate in this, in this panel with them. Now, uh, focusing on the, on the World Bank, uh, let me say that the World Bank the, uh, has uh, put uh, climate change at the heart and the forefront of our intervention ar ar around the world. Uh, in June, uh, past June, the, the World Bank uh, Board of Directors approved what is called the Climate Change Action Plan, and it includes very ambitious targets of how the World Bank is gonna be supporting our intervention uh, in cooperation, of course, in partnership with uh, our client countries. And um, for instance, uh, the, the, one of the targets is that 35% uh, on average of our financing will have to have positive impact on the climate. And also by year 2023, all our interventions will be aligned with the Paris Agreement. Together, the, the World Bank also um, is now engaging with our partners, with our client countries in defining what is what we call the uh, climate change uh, and development report. This instrument is an uh, in-depth analysis of the interplay of the climate change and the development goals of each country, so we can define more precisely how we should be moving forward. Now, all this, of course, it needs to be reflected in the transport sector and all our intervention, either regional integration or corridors in aviation, in maritime transport, in river transport, logistics, urban and rural mobility. And of course, particularly this applies to the Africa context. Um, the objective is basically to decouple the enhancement to safe and sustainable mobility from climate change impact in a way that by decarbonizing the sector, we can still achieve the broader development goals of inclusive economic growth of improving people's access to job opportunities and human capital services, and to build safer and more resilient transport systems and communities. Um, and to do so, basically, we have four pillars in the general framework that we implement. Uh, and it, it responds to four elements. Avoid, so we favor a soft mobility, they reduce the need for travel, and to the incorporation of digital solutions to this, the mobility challenges. Shift, we means to promote a model shift to mass transport system, to uh, public transport system, to no motorized transport, um, and also to uh, support inter and multimodality in the provision of uh, transport services. Uh, third is improve, so is to adopt cleaner technologies to promote electric mobility, to renew vehicle fleet in a way to improve the overall functioning and the, 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 of the transport system. And finally, the, the resilience, to improve the design of transport systems in a way that they are adapted to uh, climate uh, impact. And uh, this highlights the importance of not only the design, but also the preservation and the proper maintenance of this infrastructure. Now, uh, to do all this, the World Bank, um, is, as a financial institution, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the financing uh, element, but we also focus a lot on, on, on shared knowledge and mobilized partnership. 
Um, on the financing side, we have, uh, uh, particularly for Africa, what we call IDA, IDA financing, which is concessional financing, uh, as well as the investment that can be carried out by the International Finance Corporation, which is the private arm of the private sector arm of the World Bank. Um, and um, in this uh, financing uh, over the last two years, uh, we uh, covered for the transport sector uh, about $7 billion of new investments. And out of those, about uh, almost up to 60% of these allocations were um, designed for components that contribute directly to mitigate or adapt to climate impact. So I think that um, uh, the, the level of, of investment that we have had so far and that we would like to continue in the future. In addition, as I said, we try to provide uh, the platform to share knowledge, to analyze the potential new strategies going forward. Uh, for instance, for Western Africa, uh, the region I manage uh, uh, as a practice manager, we have been uh, analyzing the potential for electric mobility. We have also been looking at the decarbonization of maritime transport, um, build a partnership about the port sector in Western Africa, um, um, and more generally to see how we can improve urban mobility for the uh, uh, growing cities in Western Africa. Um, and then, as I said, also we try to work in partnership, not only with our financing partners, uh, like the ones that we have in the panel, uh, but also with uh, the raising of resources as part of what we call trust funds, uh, like we have the Global Environmental Facility, the Energy Sector Management Assistance Program, and also the Mobility and Logistics uh, Trust Fund. So all these uh, can help to attract additional resources for the analysis and the def definition of strategies to address climate change risks and, and challenges. Um, and last but not least, of course, uh, the program, the SSCTP program, which also plays a very essential role in the creation and sharing of knowledge and the, uh, through its influence also on urban mobility policy. Um, I go in greater depth on, on more specific examples of the type of project we are financing. Let me just very briefly to highlight, uh, for instance, the example of the Dakar BRT, which uh, we are financing alongside the European Investment Bank. And I want to highlight this one because in, when we think about financing, we need to think about the ecosystem of possibility. And um, it's not only the, the financing that comes from the uh, development partner, but it's also the one that we can try to attract from the private sector. And in this particular case, the, the, the process is, is trying to engage the private sector for the acquisition of the rolling stock and the operation of the BRT line as we move forward. Um, I think this is an important consideration how to uh, create the platform and the incentive for the private sector to come in with its efficiency, but also the financing that they can bring to, to the table. Um, um, we have tried to advance this not only in Dakar, but in other places like Abidjan, Dar es Salaam, um, we intend to continue to do so. Um, in this respect as well, uh, the, the ecosystem of financing need to consider the contribution that the users will bring about and also the, the government uh, itself. And, and here, I think with the transition that this uh, new um, way of doing business will bring about, we need to collectively think about how to continue enhancing the resources of revenue that will permit to address these big challenges we have on climate change. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive presentation. Uh, you highlighted very well how the World Bank uh, aligns both its strategy and uh, investment portfolio uh, to the Paris Agreement goals, in particular in the field of urban uh, mobility. Thank you very much. And um, now I'd like to call uh, Mrs. Uh, Davina Milenge-Uwela. She's 
Is she here? Yes, I am. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> so you uh, represent uh, the African Development Bank uh, and the Department of uh, Climate Change and Green Growth. And you're in particular the coordinator of the Africa uh, NDC Hub hosted by the bank. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emily. And uh, thanks, uh, Climate Chance. Uh, the bank and Climate Chance have a long standing uh, cooperation around supporting uh, uh, urban cities on the continent. As we all know, uh, as we look at uh, climate change on the cities, we have one of the growing mega cities on the continent. And so this is very timely that we are having this discussion around mobilizing uh, finance dedicated for cities. And so very specific for the bank, uh, we've had uh, uh, a lot of uh, of course, relationships with uh, civil society and cities in particular, and uh, uh, specifically in our infrastructure portfolio, uh, a lot of it goes to decongesting uh, uh, cities, uh, as well as uh, improving uh, uh, urban mobility. As our World Bank colleagues have noted, uh, there is a lot of collaboration between uh, MDBs as confinances uh, to drive uh, uh, resilient infrastructure. I think we've lost it, you. We have a problem with connection. We have a connection issue here. We'll just wait a minute. Just wait a few seconds just to see if that comes back. If you'll allow me, I think we'll move on to the next person, so the representative of the, to go back to this initial presentation later. So I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Neil Valentine, who's head of the Urban Mobility Division at the European Investment Bank. We've heard your vice president, Mr. Fayel, who talked about the investments of the, in terms of urban mobility, and also technical assistance for sustainable cities in Africa. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emily. And thank you for this opportunity to talk. I'm not going to repeat the analysis carried out by my colleagues at the World Bank. And I'm going to focus more on the idea of partnership, as the Vice President mentioned. And I think for us, as European Climate Bank, we see our role as technical assistance and project preparation. So yes, we do need funds, but we also need projects which are in line with the requirements of this green transition towards a more sustainable economy with infrastructure which is adapted to this. We work together with a community of donors and we take part with a lot of projects together. And I think that this way of working is what is going to enable us to speed up investment in Africa and cities and find stakeholders who are prepared to invest. So for us, there are two ways of working in terms of financial support for small businesses and banking activity in Africa, which is a significant part. And that's an issue about being clear with our financial partners to explain our requirements to them so that they can find us the right projects. And on the other hand, we have the major infrastructure program investments with standard projects like the one in Dakar, the very famous BRT that we're funding together with the World Bank. 
And in that case, we need project preparation facilities. We have several different initiatives for the moment, alongside the World Bank. We have our City Gap Fund, and this word gap means something missing between two different things. We've seen, in terms of from the donor perspective, that between these main ideas which come out at a governmental level and the projects, there's this gap. So the idea is that we create a platform to advise stakeholders about the pre-feasibility of their ideas. So can their ideas be turned into a project? And is it worth it? Is it worth investing work in preparing this project? It's something that happens in advance, but it can really help facilitate and increase the quality of a project. An initiative I'd like to talk about is that of sustainable African cities, where we're trying to work with not the biggest cities in Africa, not the leading cities in each country, but those which are in second, third place, and which have significant needs and are facing the major challenges of sharp growth, and they also need support. We have a program which aims, is targeted at these cities. So it really is this partnership and it starts right from the beginning. So we need to monitor all the major projects within these cities and the impact on the environment, on people. That needs to be done together. And that's the key message. So to speed these things up, we all need to be willing. And we all need to understand the future requirements in terms of minimizing CO2 emissions and having the least environmental impact possible. And as we have time pressures, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. So we need to strengthen institutional frameworks as you're doing with technical assistant and capacity building as well. As we heard earlier on, I think that the whole community of donors really welcomes the creation of this gap fund in advance of project preparation. And it helps local authorities to transform a project. And there's a lot of expectations about this new instrument, which comes in advance of creating projects. So thank you very much for your speech. I can see now that Evila has come back now, but I've been asked to move on to our next speaker, who's going to have to leave soon, so I'm very sorry about that. I will come back to you later. So now we're going to welcome Alexandre Pointier, who is director of the French Development Agency for Senegal, Gambia, Cape Verde, and Guinea-Bissau. Mr. Pointier, it's you're here. We have heard earlier on another speaker talking about sustainable mobility means you are leading the larger agency of the uh, French agency for development. How do you 
support economic growth and include the challenges of climate change. Can you explain to us in a few words? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you. In a few words, I just want to thank the climate change teams. I'm in Dakar on the field. I uh, saw so the preparation work that went on. Your question, talking about combining fighting against climate change and growth, economic growth is of course fundamental. The question is to know whether this is compatible in some of the countries that are more developed. Fortunately, for countries like Senegal, this is not an issue. And the strategy of the French Development Agency is to help those, our partners in this transition, economic and energetic transition. How do we make this compatible? In two ways. Some of our partners have said that we were trying to make sure that this would be aligned to the Paris Agreement. Practically speaking, 100% of our project, we make sure that the projects do not question the commitments of the Paris Agreement. Secondly, we make sure that half of our portfolio brings some co-benefits to reach our commitments in terms of mitigation or adaptation. These projects that are really bringing something more, or at least 30% of our projects are really playing a role in terms of preserving biodiversity. And we've been doing this since 2018. We try to encourage favorable growth, sustainable growth without impacting the climate, the environment. Practically speaking, how do we do this in Senegal? Two examples. Looking from a territorial perspective, this is not the way that uh, financial backers normally look at it. But if we look at Greater Dakar, and this was mentioned, the Senegalese authorities in terms of sustainable mobility with several important projects around transport tomorrow, uh, buses or TER, etc. This collective transport do have positive consequences, economically speaking and environmentally speaking, less pollution, less CO2 emission, etc. Other things which we don't see often is a better uh, rainfall management. This is a huge challenge. Besides these mobility aspects, we want to have an holistic approach to strengthen the social, societal and environmental impact to make sure that there, are be, there will be Senegalese people who can drive those buses and those trains, who can also uh, help with mechanics, etc. And we want to also develop local capacities with a support uh, to the uh, air management center and the pollution center in Dakar. We're also funding another project to promote tourism with opportunities for development. San Luis is a beautiful city. We also, in parallel, support another project to support coastal areas We have a decentralization, decentralization program, which the president of the Association of Mayors mentioned earlier on, and also another program for waste management, another challenge for mitigation and adaptation. We try to have a holistic approach, biodiversity, climate, human and population development. As a conclusion, two things which are Two things which are noticed, we need to collectively take it further to be more radical in uh, taking on board the adaptation aspect. The IPCC report should help us to focus more 
on adaptation on the horizon of 230, 250. We need to be vigilant when it comes to the economic and ecological transition to reduce inequalities as much as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Poitier, for this uh, presentation. The French Development Agency is known to encourage this holistic approach to strengthen capacities, to build capacities in the long term. We heard your call for taking on board adaptation and urban resilience, the new challenges also in terms of access to funding. We should be working in the coming years on nature-based solutions as well to help protect biodiversity and adapt to climate change consequences. I'm now going to give back the floor to Davina, uh, whom we had lost earlier on. Mrs. Davina milenge Wella. Please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Uh, I guess it's part of uh, the infrastructure that our cities uh, still have to grow. And uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we all suffer uh, power cuts. That was a very practical example. And uh, so back to what I was saying, uh, I think I left off talking about the uh, Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program that the bank and the Global Center on Adaptation has uh, uh, launched. It was launched in January. It is a $25 billion uh, program of up to 2025. 20, uh, Ideally, it has four pillars, one of them being uh, resilient infrastructure, uh, because as we all know, and uh, our colleagues have spoken uh, here, uh, Africa still lacks uh, uh, infrastructure development. I think 80% is estimated as uh, uh, yet to be built. So we have a chance and opportunity to, to develop a resilient infrastructure. And so the task ahead of us is to mobilize resources at scale uh, uh, to do two things, have infrastructure that, that is resilient uh, uh, to uh, our colleague at uh, AFD mentioned the IPCC report that is res uh, infrastructure that is resilient to the, the threats that are ahead of us as we head into uh, uh, 2050 uh, pathway. Now, uh, I think uh, what would help us as we look into what is really practical is to uh, uh, look at examples that we've done uh, well as uh, financiers, as uh, entities of government, and, uh, and even as civil society, and then uh, leverage those or even replicate them. Because uh, uh, when you look around, you're going to see very good uh, uh, examples. They might not be many, but they are there where uh, we can, as uh, partners in development, uh, collaborate. So as the African Development Bank, uh, we are guided by uh, uh, the Sustainable Urban Development Action Plan in uh, financing for, uh, for infrastructure development. So I'll just highlight a few that we can uh, uh, consider some highlights on this on our end. Uh, the bank has approved about 12 billion uh, overall of climate finance uh, during its action plan in uh, 2016 uh, 2020, the, the action plan, the period that has just lapsed, uh, lapsed. And of that, 5 billion was for urban uh, focused projects uh, and transport and water supply. And, uh, and of those uh, infrastructure, energy played a, a bigger one. Uh, it was 61%, uh, followed by water supply, which was about 19% uh, in transport at 16%. So in, nine, in 2019 alone, the bank committed about uh, 2.2 billion of financing of uh, uh, infrastructure and urban development through a diversified portfolio. And this project is uh, expected uh, to create about 2,500 jobs, uh, mostly in uh, construction, and uh, others as uh, uh, spin-offs uh, through indirect job uh, created. 
And uh, and uh, when you look at the financing, most of it was through loans, uh, majority of them being sovereign loans to government. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, what I think we should, and, uh, and I think it's good that we speak to this uh, on this uh, climate chance uh, uh, forum, that uh, there is need and there is possibility to mobilize uh, and transfer uh, financial resources very urgently and very quickly. Uh, what we've seen uh, with the COVID financing, especially for, for the developed world, they were able to mobilize trillions of dollars very fast to, to boost uh, their, their economies. And so the, the agency and the sense of push that I think uh, uh, partners in climate change should uh, push all, all of us should push is to look at where resources are, uh, financing resources are. And uh, one uh, particular one is uh, the IMF's uh, special drawing rights uh, that have just been uh, issued. And uh, the bulk of those are with uh, the development countries that actually don't need them because they've just revived their economies. If those resources could be channeled to uh, emerging economies, including uh, the African continent, and through institutions such as the multilateral development banks or even national development banks to quickly uh, 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 boost the economies. Uh, as you know, with the, with the COVID uh, situation, uh, Africa had the first recession in 25 years. And so with these resources, we would be able to, uh, to grow green and grow inclusively. So the, the agency is that, uh, yes, we have the resources, yes, we have the facilities, but they are not near enough to the need. And so if Africa has to play a chance uh, or have a chance uh, to go uh, uh, net zero by 2050, as a continent that has the population that is going to be most uh, growing, we definitely need to uh, lobby. We have another chance in uh, in, the, uh, in November at COP26 to really more mobilize for resources. One, that the uh, SDRs uh, should be channeled. Really, it is justice that we, you, you can't have uh, growth if all the regions are not growing. And, uh, and, and we've seen that with migration and uh, uh, to, to, to Europe, that uh, as you leave regions behind, the problem comes to your door. And so the idea is that uh, we mobilize resources where they are to, to make impact very quickly. Second is the climate finance of 100 billion per year that is yet to be uh, committed. Uh, there was pledges, but uh, it's been years that you don't see uh, those resources uh, uh, on the table. And so uh, in terms of uh, 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 mobilizing resources and technology transfer and skills enhancement, I think we have the right uh, infrastructure uh, uh, to, uh, on the continent that can absorb those, they, they, what is needed is for all the stakeholders uh, to be on the table and, uh, and de-risk the flow of climate, uh, the concession of financing, development financing. The second is to engage the private sector. Oftentimes when we have this forum, it is development uh, uh, partners speaking with uh, uh, national entities. You often will not see the private sector involved and as we know that uh, for the billions that are required for, uh, if you look at the African NDCs, it's a $3 trillion uh, opportunity. 70% of those resources will have to come from the private sector. But if you ask around which private sector even know what an NDC is, they're very, very few. So our financial sector is yet to be mobilized. Uh, and, and without that, then uh, you cannot block uh, the, the, the trillions that need to, to come through. So at the bank, we've created what we call the Africa Financial Alliance on Climate Change to uh, create awareness uh, uh, for the financial sector on the continent. One, uh, to diversify their portfolio in, in creating uh, uh, the right incentives for the private sector to come in, to look for uh, blending opportunities, to look for catalyzing uh, opportunities, and also to, uh, uh, to learn to uh, uh, play on the global scale uh, because uh, you're seeing a lot of sustainability finance in terms of the asset owners 
and the asset managers. So there's a whole lot of push for sustainability finance, but there's, there's uh, a lot of uh, requirements, whether it is uh, disclosures uh, that need to be, in, and, and also in terms of standards and uh, transparency that need to be uh, uh, deployed. And so with that uh, uh, in, uh, initiative on uh, mobilizing the financial sector, we hope that we will then get domestic resources that can leverage uh, external finance. So I'll stop here uh, for now so <laughs> we can have uh, an interactive session. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you so much for this uh, great presentation. Um, what I heard about your very uh, concrete proposal on financing engineering to finance the climate transition is uh, the importance to mobilize public development banks, including national development banks uh, in the uh, recovery packages. Uh, and uh, on this point, I'd like to draw your attention to the um, uh, finance climate pathway endorsed by the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, which is uh, the global coalition of non-state uh, non stakeholders uh, led by the high-level champions of the COP. Uh, they have released two pathways, one on human settlements and one on finance that promote the role of financial intermediation uh, through uh, development banks, national development banks and sub-national development banks, the banks uh, dedicated to finance the sub-national level. So this is a very interesting um, analysis. And also I hear, um, I, really, I really liked your presentation about the Africa Finance Alliance for Climate Change, uh, because of course we need to find solutions to attract private finance. And uh, these uh, uh, MPGCA uh, pathways that will be presented at the COP also highlight the role of uh, vehicles for blended finance uh, that allow uh, to unlock private investment based on public incentives. So these are really uh, interested uh, solutions to be uh, developed. And of course, uh, we all need to work on uh, alignment of banks uh, to uh, the, the global agenda standards. And on this point, I also uh, invite you to participate to the next Finance in Common Summit that will be organized uh, in Rome uh, in uh, October, that will gather all uh, public development banks uh, to discuss on this, this alignment uh, with the, the global agendas. Thank you very much. Et maintenant, euh, je vais appeler donc euh, le dernier euh, intervenant, euh, donc euh, Monsieur Sébastien Soleil, qui est responsable de la transition énergétique et de l'environnement à BNP Paribas. Euh, Monsieur Soleil, pouvez-vous nous expliquer comment une banque commerciale euh, comme euh, BNP Paribas peut contribuer au financement de la transition climatique locale en Afrique Merci beaucoup. Oui, merci à vous. Bon après-midi à tous. Et donc, bon, c'est plus dur d'intervenir maintenant parce qu'il y a déjà beaucoup de choses intéressantes qui ont été dites, mais je vais essayer d'apporter quelques éléments nouveaux. Alors, déjà, chez BNP Paribas, quand on parle de mobilité durable et de décarbonisation du transport urbain, euh, on voit ça vraiment sous, sous trois axes. Premièrement, euh, décongestion des voies publiques. Donc, euh, alors, ça peut se faire via de, via de l'autopartage, via des applications qui orientent les, les utilisateurs euh, au moment où c'est le moins congestionné, donc premièrement, décongestion. Euh, deuxièmement, euh, accroissement de tout ce qui est euh, multimo multimodalité, transport public, euh, mobilité de tous, on a beaucoup parlé de mobilité active. Et troisièmement, déploiement de motorisation intervenant plus propre. Donc, quand on dit ça, on voit bien qu'il y a une, multi une multiplicité d'acteurs, pouvoir public, opérateurs de transport public, euh, utilisateurs citoyens, etc., etc., producteurs de véhicules, producteurs de carburant, et qu'il y a énormément d'actions euh, derrière tout ça, et que ça peut passer par énormément de, 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 de types de financement possibles. Donc, il faut vraiment voir… Euh, donc, il y a deux choses très importantes qu'on a, à mon avis, tous en tête, mais qui est bien de rappeler, et parce que ça a des impacts sur le financement. D'une part, cette décarbonisation, cette transition vers une mobilité durable, ça inclut forcément une multiplicité d'acteurs. Donc, pour qu'un financement soit viable, il faut travailler avec beaucoup de monde. Alors, typiquement, ce qu'on voit en Europe ou partout, c'est que si on veut développer une flotte de véhicules électriques, c'est bien de financer les véhicules électriques, mais s'il n'y a pas une source de financement pour les bornes de recharge, 
euh, électrique, ça ne sert à rien. Donc voilà, c'est vraiment des projets, même au niveau du financement, très, très euh, partenariaux. Et il faut trouver sur chaque brique euh, de ces projets partenariaux euh, un financement adapté. Donc, quelques idées euh, qu'on tire de notre expérience, hein, mais les types de financement euh, auxquels on peut penser, il y en a bien d'autres. Il y a déjà au niveau des grands projets d'infrastructure ou des, des grands investissements au niveau des flottes, il y a tout ce qui est le, le mécanisme assez traditionnel, le financement d'infrastructures, de financement de projets, avec possibilité ensuite euh, de placer ces investissements euh, via la sécurisation sur les marchés euh, internationaux de capitaux qui sont assez friands euh, de, de tous ces produits euh, verts liés à la transition écologique, à la transition énergétique, à la transition juste. Donc, gros financement de projet. Et après, il y a beaucoup plus de trucs plus parcellaires, mais qui sont très, très importants aussi. Euh, typiquement, euh, BNP Paribas, on a une filiale de gestion de flotte, Arval, qui peut faire de la gestion de flotte, du financement et de l'aide à la gestion de flotte pour des, des flottes de plus en plus vertes. Alors, ça peut être des flottes de petits véhicules, des flottes de bus, des utilitaires légers, etc. Ça peut passer également par des crédits spécifiques soit pour des PME, soit pour des particuliers, des crédits spécifiques pour des véhicules plus écologiques. Euh, ça peut passer par du leasing aussi. On a une filiale de leasing solution qui peut faire du leasing euh, un peu de véhicules, mais surtout de bornes de recharge. Euh, ça peut passer aussi par des actions d'économie de, circulaire pour maximiser l'usage des véhicules. Euh, donc, toute une série de choses et avec des outils de financement adaptés. Alors, ce qu'on a déjà mis en place, je peux donner rapidement quelques exemples concrets. Ce qu'on essaie de développer de plus en plus, par exemple, c'est avec notre filiale de leasing et notre filiale de gestion de flotte, des partenariats où on, avec un, un partenaire gestionnaire de flotte ou éventuellement une autorité publique, on développe le financement conjoint des véhicules électriques et des bandes de recharge pour être sûr d'avoir les, les deux bouts de la chaîne et pour que les systèmes se tiennent de vie. Donc, à la fois gestion de flotte et euh, leasing sur des bandes de recharge. Un autre exemple là, qui vient euh, aussi d'Europe, mais j'ai d'autres exemples non européens après, euh, où on a mis en place, on a contribué au financement d'une flotte euh, de camions à l'hydrogène. Donc là, c'est pareil, c'était très euh, partenarial, parce qu'il fallait euh, mettre autour de la table donc le financier, donc notamment BNP Paribas, le gestionnaire de la flotte de camions, le producteur de camions hydrogène, parce qu'il voilà, fallait des, des, des camions adaptés, ce n'est quand même pas, pas encore le plus grand des camions, et euh, les infrastructures de recharge en hydrogène. Donc, vraiment hein, quelque chose de multipartenarial pour qu'une fois qu'on arrive au stade du financement, on ait un ensemble qui, 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 qui soit autoportant et qui soit, qui, qui soit complet. En Afrique, notre filiale BMCI aussi, on est au Maroc, elle a lancé un certain nombre de, 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 de projets assez différents aussi, mais qui font partie vraiment de tous ces efforts de décarbonisation de la mobilité urbaine. C'est notamment, il y a une appli, de, on a lancé avec une filiale de la BMCI une application de covoiturage. Donc ça, c'est quand même dans tout ce qui est multimodalité et décongestion, le, tout ce qui est partage de l'information via des apps, via des outils digitaux est vraiment un outil relativement facile à mettre en œuvre et absolument clé. Euh, et toujours notre filiale BMCI, un autre partenariat, là c'était un, un partenariat avec un fournisseur de moto électrique où on offrait à nos collaborateurs euh, un, des, des conditions de, de financement de cette moto électrique plus attractive pour euh, pousser le développement de cette mobilité plus durable. Donc voilà, une importance en deux, deux gros messages, vraiment une importance des projets partenariaux et d'avoir tous les partenaires globaux, euh, tous les partenaires nécessaires autour de la table pour avoir une approche systémique pour que le projet tienne la route. Et en face, des besoins de financement très variés qui doivent s'adapter à tous ces acteurs, à toutes ces briques. Et donc, une multiplicité d'outils de, de financement qu'on doit réfléchir euh, pour s'adapter à toutes ces briques de, de ces projets complexes et passionnants et nécessaires pour la transition énergétique. Merci. Merci infiniment à vous. Euh, alors, je vais reprendre un peu les deux points euh, de votre conclusion pour conclure ce panel. Euh, donc, je remercie vraiment euh, tous les intervenants qui ont vraiment euh, présenté euh, de manière extrêmement passionnante euh, les, leurs expériences et leurs recommandations pour renforcer le financement euh, de la transition climat locale. Euh, 
Euh, et donc, euh, je m'appuierai sur votre conclusion. Effectivement, euh, ce panel a démontré l'importance de travailler ensemble pour justement faire rejoindre l'offre et la demande de financement, donc renforcer les capacités des gouvernements nationaux et locaux, donc les capacités institutionnelles, la capacité de préparation de projets, aligner les investissements donc des acteurs financiers avec les, 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 les objectifs globaux, donc notamment le nexus climat-développement, euh, travailler ensemble au meilleur mix financier euh, via euh, l'intermédiation financière, euh, le partenariat avec le secteur privé. Et enfin, euh, comme vous l'avez dit, euh, les besoins sont extrêmement variés euh, et ça tombe bien puisque le secteur de la finance est un secteur qui est extrêmement innovant. Donc, continuez, euh, continuons à ouais, innover ensemble. Et euh, je me permets de terminer, euh, de conclure en vous invitant à participer donc, euh, à la Africa Climate Week, qui est organisée par les Nations Unies en préparation de la COP26 de Glasgow. Et pour vous indiquer que différents side events seront organisés euh, entre le 27 et le 29 septembre sur le financement de la transition locale. Donc, vous pouvez y participer. Et notamment, le FMDV organise euh, un side event le 27 septembre sur les solutions euh, pour la finance climat des villes. Merci beaucoup. Merci Émilie, merci à tous. Euh, sans plus attendre, euh, je repasse la parole à, à Dakar euh, pour la remise des prix de l'innovation par Madame Irène Migasson, ambassadrice de l'Union européenne. Bonjour, je suis M. Ndiaye. Hello. Euh, donc, co-president of Africa Mobility. Alors, nous avons 10 minutes pour le déroulement. For this last part of our program. Just one quick word. Africa Mobility is an organization of young researchers whose ambition is to support public powers in Africa to implement transport solutions we have worked to help several initiatives to encourage entrepreneurship entrepreneurship with young people thank you to the eu who has accepted to finance this initiative we have developed a strategy to select with some criteria, selective criteria, inclusive and transparent, a selection of the projects. We have received 43 projects during that co contest. We had to first select the various projects to look at the relevancies of these projects and the technical conditions. Then we selected the first 10 projects to come to a selection of three prize awarding. These three prizes is given to the Biogenve Senegal project represented by Mr. Ndiaye in order to have on the market a green fuel with biogas and biometal in order to decarbonize the transport means. Second price highlights another project, ICOMOT, which is a carpooling project to mutualize transport to diminish by three. This is the objective of this project to divide by three and also act on congestion. And finally, the third prize, the second, the third winner, Projet euh, donc euh, représenté par le jeune donc la Marana Balde et qui consiste à la conception et à la mise en œuvre de 
smart um, traffic lights in order to improve the flow of traffic. Without further ado, I'm now giving the floor to Mr. Ndiaye to present his project as a winner. And then we will give the floor to Her Excellency, Mrs. Ambassador, Mrs. Irene Mingasson. Thank you very much. Thank you to those who chose my project, our project. Thank you to those who believed in us and supported us in this project. This pride is the beginning of a new walk alongside other actors in the transport sector for the environment, with the help also of the Association of Mayors, who trusted me more than five years ago, and all of the other financial partners who've been with us in this great challenge. We are convinced this, this, that this is a partnership project. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just wanted to say that for the videos of the two other projects, you can find them online on the CETUD official website. I'm now giving the floor to Mrs. Irene Mingasson, and I want to thank the CETUD to help us. And I hope next time we can do it also with Kodatu and Climate Chance. Mrs. Ambassador, this is you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, uh, Thank you very much, Mr. President of the jury, for your introduction. Of course, I'm extremely happy to be here with you. Thank you for welcoming me here and we want to congratulate our winner and climate chance as well for this particular time and the celebration of this uh, prize award it was important for us to be here to be here physically with you today to be taking part to this event we are glad that we were able to be here this year to support you. And you said earlier that there will be an institu institutionalization of this prize, which is a good thing. To recognize talents, it's important to be here, of course, because of what this prize represents. This is our DNA, the DNA of our partnership. This is our common vision of a positive move for a more inclusive, more innovative, a greener environment. I'm going to take off my face mask while I'm talking. This is our approach as well as the European Union and the approach of the Team Europe and many of our speakers who all share in this same commitment. And we have mentioned this while discussing all the various projects at a large scale. We want to commit all of our efforts, combine of our efforts for these, this project, Team Europe, which is uh, showing this approach. Coming back to the prize, 
this is a celebration. There is creativity, there is innovation, ingeniosity. This prize is there to encourage all those efforts. Congratulations to all the 43 projects which were selected, which were presented, that's wonderful. I'm sure you had difficulties making a decision and choosing, which is why it's important to mark this event just before COP26 and COP27, which will take place in Africa. These are challenging moments, sometimes can be raising anxiety, but it's important also to have optimism, optimistic messages. And I think our prize winner and all those who have contributed to this contest and have submitted innovative projects, we all participate, participate in this optimistic language. I think it's also showing that in Senegal, in Africa, it is possible. These things actually do work. And as usual, I'm happy to be able to contribute to this celebration. I think we're going to now give the prize to the prize winner. So you can come and stand next to me. Congratulations. Well deserved prize. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Alors pour les, les lauréats numéro 2 et numéro 3, ce n'était pas tout remis. Nous allons euh, organiser. Pour les autres prix gagnants, il y aura une autre cérémonie. Bravo et merci pour l'engagement et l'inspiration. Merci. Congratulations et well done. Merci à tous pour ce moment. Thank you all for this time. Congratulations for CETUD. For, this, for steering this process, which was a little bit difficult, we had a lot of success. We had many innovations, many projects. So it was very difficult to actually select the best prizes, the best winners. We tried to do it in an inclusive manner, in a transparent manner. Which, you know, this was a, a fascinating experience also for us. Thank you. Thank you. On vous repasse la main, Romain, pour les bonnes conclusions. Romain, you have the floor for the conclusion. Thank you, everyone. In order to close this meeting session, this uh, morning session, Mr. Sakudatia, advisor to the Minister, Environmental Minister in Senegal, and the General Secretary of Infrastructure in Senegal. You have the floor for the conclusion. Bonjour. Euh, merci bien. Donc, euh, je vais essayer un peu de, de passer quelques, quelques mots à la conclusion. Bien que j'ai eu d'énormes difficultés pour me connecter euh, dans ce webinaire. Donc, euh, je n'ai pas suivi toutes les, toutes les présentations. Euh, parce qu'il y a eu des problèmes de technologie, ensuite euh, j'ai eu quelques difficultés de connexion. Je m'en excuse. Néanmoins, je, je voulais en tout cas saluer cette euh, grande initiative. Euh, euh, donc, euh, 
et vous dire qu'il euh, donc euh, le ministère de l'environnement et du développement durable est très intéressé par euh, ce panneau de haut niveau. Je pense que euh, ce que j'ai eu euh, à entendre euh, dans certaines des annotations nous, nous réconforte dans le le challenge qui nous attend par rapport donc, à la mobilité urbaine, c'est une problématique euh, qui va au-delà du Sénégal, de, de l'ensemble des pays de l'Afrique. Et je pense qu'aujourd'hui, euh, on devrait euh, prendre beaucoup plus donc, de, de rigueur et proposition des solutions durables et viables dans vraiment l'impact en tout cas du transport euh, sur le climat d'une manière générale. Euh, J'ai noté quand même euh, des points assez, assez intéressants. Des points assez intéressants. Euh, je vais peut-être en citer quelques-uns qui méritent d'être approfondis et d'être mis en œuvre, euh, en tout cas pour euh, vraiment la prise en compte donc, de nos stratégie de nos politiques, de nos actions en faveur donc, euh, du, du climat. À cet effet, euh, nous avons noté quand même assez intéressant euh, sur les aspects de renouvellement de la flotte euh, qui est vieillissante au niveau dans le pays. Donc c'est un transport quand même qui est assez vieillissant et je pense que euh, pour tenir en compte, euh, pour atténuer, pour réduire euh, la pollution sur l'atmosphère, je pense qu'il faudrait quand même euh, voir la possibilité de, 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 de renouveler cette flotte, en tout cas qui cause beaucoup de dégâts sur notre environnement. Euh, donc, revoir également le, le système de, de transport. Et je pense que ça... Il faudrait que l'approche soit novatrice. Il faut qu'il y ait en tout cas de nouveaux paradigmes en matière donc, de, de gestion des transports et, et surtout changer de comportement et privilégier les transports collectifs. Donc, euh, au lieu donc, de, de vraiment privilégier les transports, les transports individuels, qui augmente en tout cas les pollutions sur euh, l'atmosphère. Et également, je pense qu'il faudrait euh, mettre l'accent sur la promotion donc, euh, des, des émissions plus propres, n'est-ce pas, donc en matière d'énergie. Et sur ce également, c'est un peu d'améliorer, en tout cas globalement, le secteur de l'emploi. Euh, quand on prend l'exemple le, des, des, des motocyclettes, euh, on a parlé dans les interventions du cas du Bénin, du Burkina Faso, mais également, je pense que ça commence à prendre l'emploi dans tous les pays africains. Et régler le problème de l'emploi de manière globale permet, en tout cas, de, de, de réduire l'impact de ce mode de transport au niveau de notre pays. Le, le Sénégal a déjà donc pris une grande initiative en, en, en mettant en place un recrutement de jeunes, de, de, de 10, 000, 10 000 jeunes au niveau donc, euh, du ministère de l'Environnement et du Développement Durable, euh, notamment au niveau donc, de l'Agence sénégalaise de la Réforestation de la grande et également aussi au niveau de la gestion des eaux et forêts et chasse et de la conservation et au niveau de la direction de l'environnement et des établissements classés. Tout ça permet en tout cas de, 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 de mettre en bras euh, un grand programme d'atténuation de, des changements climatiques. Donc c'est des jeunes qui vont intervenir dans le basement, euh, dans la protection des forêts, donc, euh, dans la production de plants. Et tout ça, donc c'est des aspects qui sont très importants pour réduire l'impact de euh, l'empreinte carbone en tout cas sur, sur, sur les milieux urbains. Donc, c'est pour vous dire que donc, nous, avons donc, euh, nous, sommes, nous sommes en phase avec cette approche de réduire euh, l'impact des transports au niveau urbain. 
Et il faut également mettre l'accent sur, mettre l'accent sur, mettre l'accent sur euh, des aspects liés un peu euh, à notre environnement. Il faudrait aujourd'hui mettre en place un système de séquestration de carbone assez important. Et ça, ça nous appelle à mettre en place des espaces verts au niveau urbain, mais également à mettre l'accent sur le reboisement pour en tout cas créer des puits de carbone. Et ça permet d'augmenter la séquestration du carbone atmosphérique et ça c'est très important dans le cadre de la réduction de l'impact euh, du, du transport sur le climat. Donc, euh, brièvement, donc, excusez-moi, euh, excusez monsieur Tiakou, il faut qu'on on laisse la parole à monsieur Sania qui. Tout à fait. Donc, je suis, en train, je suis en train de conclure. Merci. Voilà, donc, c'est quelques recommandations que j'avais à partager avec vous et je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, donc, monsieur, euh, monsieur Aubin Jules Marcel Sania, secrétaire général du ministère des infrastructures, des transports terrestres et du désenclavement. Merci pour vos mots de conclusion. Euh, merci. Je voudrais présenter au nom du ministre Mansour Fay, ministre des Infrastructures, des Transports terrestres euh, et du désenclavement du Sénégal, tous nos remerciements aux participants à cette importante euh, réunion. Euh, je voudrais dire combien nous avons été heureux d'entendre des débats très fructueux sur les questions qui ont été abordées relativement au changement climatique, relativement à la protection de l'environnement, euh, sur les thèmes de mobilité, d'action sociale et de financement. Je crois d'abord la question de la mobilité elle est très, très prégnante, très importante pour les pouvoirs publics africains, sénégalais en particulier. C'est pourquoi nous avons développé, comme cela a été dit, des projets de mobilité, de, de, de transport de masse, tels que le TER, euh, le train express régional et le BRT, qui sont très favorables euh, à la protection de la nature. Donc, cela est extrêmement important. Sur la question de l'action locale, je crois qu'il est important qu'on arrive, avec les pouvoirs publics, à mettre une bonne synergie, une bonne cohérence entre les schémas directeurs des infrastructures de transport et des plans de transport, avec la planification au niveau local. Quand je dis planification au niveau local, ce sont les plans locaux de développement, ce sont les plans de développement urbain. Il faut une prise en charge de la question de la mobilité au niveau de cette planification, au niveau décentralisé. Euh, L'autre question ici qui a été abordée, c'est la question des financements. Je crois qu'on a bien trouvé, euh, la, comme on dit, la quadrature du cercle, il faut une bonne synergie d'action entre l'État central avec les structures décentralisées, les communes, les départements, les régions qui ont un rôle important à jouer, mais aussi avec les partenaires techniques et financiers et il faut le dire avec le secteur privé qui a un rôle extrêmement important à jouer. Au Sénégal, en tout cas, avec la loi, la nouvelle loi d'orientation des transports la prise en charge des préoccupations climatiques, la question des financements pour euh, des outils, des instruments de transport modernes, moins polluants, a été très prise en compte par la nouvelle loi qui encadre les transports terrestres au Sénégal. C'est de ce point de vue que je voudrais solliciter, euh, euh, féliciter, féliciter les lauréats qui, du prix qui, qui ont été décernés euh, pour leur dire euh, toutes nos satisfactions par rapport à la qualité de leur euh, proposition. De ce point de vue, je voudrais féliciter le CETUD d'avoir qui a eu l'excellente initiative d'organiser ce, ce concours, ce prix pour l'innovation. C'est très important et pour le futur, c'est des challenges extrêmement importants. Mais je voudrais remercier aussi très sincèrement, au nom du gouvernement du Sénégal, l'Union européenne, en particulier Madame, son Excellence l'ambassadrice Irène Mingasson, pour l'appui constant et renouvelé de l'Union européenne mais aussi pour ce soutien particulier à l'égard du prix que nous avons décerné ce matin. Enfin, je voudrais remercier tous les participants, tous les organisateurs. Je vais nommer la CODATU, euh, qui est un partenaire très euh, structurant et très intéressant de l'État du Sénégal en matière de mobilité. Je voudrais remercier Climate Science pour son partenariat très efficace et efficient. Euh, L'adression des... Euh, de l'environnement et des établissements classés, mais en général le ministère de l'environnement du Sénégal, 
remercier le CETUG et donner rendez-vous en espérant que nous, nous y serons tous présents avec une occurrence moins forte du COVID pour que nous puissions avoir une participation populaire, mais présence en présence physique est, est très intéressante. Donc, donner rendez-vous en 2022 à Dakar pour les travaux que nous aurons prochainement sur les questions de mobilité et de transport qui sont essentielles et structurantes pour le développement en Afrique et dans le monde. Je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention. Merci. C'est donc Bernard Soula, je, je vous prie d'excuser Romain Mantec, le sénateur qui a été obligé de repartir au Sénat compte tenu de notre retard. Et je voulais simplement vous remercier tous et aussi toutes les équipes techniques qui ont permis que ça se passe globalement très très bien ce matin, même si on a beaucoup de retard évidemment. Tous les partenaires, je crois que c'est très important de savoir que nous avions beaucoup de partenaires. Et pour ne pas être plus long, deux, deux éléments centraux. D'abord, nous allons ouvrir le Summit Climate Change sur l'autre adresse que vous avez reçue pour tous ceux qui souhaitent nous rejoindre. Il n'y aura pas d'interruption compte tenu de notre retard. Donc, si vous souhaitez, vous pouvez, comme c'est indiqué sur le chat, basculer sur l'autre adresse. Et deuxièmement, comme ça vient d'être fait par nos partenaires sénégalais, vous donnez rendez-vous l'année prochaine. Et cette fois-ci, euh, vraiment, nous, nous l'espérons, et on pourrait dire, on est presque sûr, mais avec la vie que nous avons connue, rien n'est vraiment sûr. On se donne rendez-vous l'année prochaine à Dakar, et puis pour beaucoup d'entre vous aussi, sans doute, à Glasgow. Et on se tiendra au courant pour qu'on se retrouve à Glasgow, car c'est évidemment un moment essentiel. Merci à tous, et puis rendez-vous à tous ceux qui sont intéressés par le Sommet Climate Change dans quelques instants très rapides pour ce sommet. Et pour les autres, je leur souhaite une très bonne journée. À bientôt.